soft-spoken 49-year-old native of South Boston. But don't be fooled by the low-key, matter-of-fact way he answers questions about his life of crime. You seem to have committed every crime in the book. You beat people up? Yes. Put them in the hospital? Yes. Shot, stabbed people? Yes. Helped kidnap people? Yes. And you were an accessory to murders? Correct. That's a... That's quite a resume. It's the business we're in. Hey, what's up, guys? I wanted to take a second to remind you, please hit that subscribe button. And if you like what we're doing and want to support the channel, you can do that via Cash App at American Made Channel. Now, let's jump into the video. The key is to know when to use uh, your fist and when not to, and you know, when to talk to people, and when to, some people you can't talk to. So, you know, we, we started out having small conversations, and uh, gradually um, he took me into his confidence, and I started a uh, small-time bookmaking with friends of mine that would place bets with me. And the bets led to some people couldn't pay, and so, uh, you know, I'd have to put them on the, the shelf. They would pay a vig on the money they owed me. And then as my business got bigger, some people couldn't pay that, and that led to, uh, you know, some people getting hurt, and th that led to extortion charges. You know, well, I'm not eventually it took, but it was extortion. Mm -hmm. And then uh, as my career went on with uh, Jim Balto, I got involved in more and more violent crimes. It just, you know, it was baby steps, but eventually it ended up in the ultimate crime of murder. Well, I mean, he, he was, you know, my uh, closest friend. We shared, you know, we talked a lot about everything. We just had a normal relationship as far as that outside of uh, business. I mean, naturally, we discussed business all the time, but outside of that, it was just a normal relationship, a friendship. And, uh, you know, there's nothing that this man would ask me that I wouldn't do because I trusted him 100%. I believed in him 100%. And then when everything came out, I mean, I felt betrayed. Most, most people uh, really in the town didn't know what he looked like. Uh, you know, he didn't come out till late in the afternoon, maybe 3, 3 30, 4 o'clock. And most of our dealings were at nighttime. I mean, it was the cover of darkness, which was free, free camouflage. So a lot of people don't know what he looked like. You know, I mean, he was a stone cold killer. When a banker goes to work, uh, he's dealing with money all the time. When a criminal, uh, you know, an organized crime, you, you know, there's chances you're dealing with violence. That's part of the business. The Italian mob, I mean, has a lot of teeth, you know. I mean, they're, you know, they're a dangerous crew, someone to be reckoned with. But at that time, uh, in the city of Boston, uh, the Irish crew that was here, went to Hill and stuff, rivaled them. Yeah. I mean, they had just as many shooters, so, you know, yeah. and uh, people out there. So it was kind of, you know, there was a truce and there was a working relationship with them at that time. Jim Belgium. You know, he would talk. I mean, he didn't yell, he didn't swear. Uh, we had a good working relationship and we had a, a friendship. And uh, we had good times together. And, uh, you know, we weren't out committing crimes every day. People think you're a criminal, you're doing something every day. We weren't. Uh, most of the time, uh, it was boring. We were doing nothing, everything was already established. So basically all we had to do is once a week uh, pick up uh, envelopes of money that was coming in from different sources. So it was kind of a boring life, believe it or not. Well, yeah, I mean, he's, you know, he's controversial. He likes to write things, and uh, he doesn't care who it affects. He wrote an article about this fellow who was a young kid that I knew uh, he's in his family, and he, and he said he was a member of the FFA, Future Felons of America. And uh, it was later on, the city settled with the family, gave him 500000 for wrongful death. And we were just, you know, kind of reading. We had nothing to do. We uh, Everything was going smooth at the time for us. And Jim Bulger decided to make him a, a hobby. And uh, we we're going to kill him. The first plan we had was to, uh, to you know, and again, he makes uh, light of this, like, oh, this is, you know, an episode from the Three Stooges or something. We had uh, C4. We had, like, 17 kilos of it. When we were going to take that and put it in a basketball, and put it in front of his house and uh, when he come out just remote control blow it up and you know we uh, we had uh, electric detonators we had fuse detonators and everything so it wouldn't have been a problem but the, we just felt that a blast that big would have taken out 
the whole house and you know probably been other casualties so he went against that so his next plan was to wrap dead cord around a tree and just take that down and let it just crash into the house and uh you know he thought about that for a while and he decided not to and so uh, i just went out there one one morning early in the morning and i was across the street in the graveyard and uh, i had 30 on six the scope waiting for him to come out and he came walking out to get in. He had a, uh, I think it was a silver Volvo he was getting into, but he had his, I saw his daughter at the last minute. He was holding her hand. So I passed on it. And then uh, some other things come up, and we got on to other things. So he was kind of like put on the back burner, forgotten about. At that time, we really hadn't, uh, you know, we changed our MO a little bit. You know, instead of just walking up and shooting someone or snatching them off the street and making them disappear, we figured, you know, uh, bombing because he was uh, hated, uh, no one you know, basically uh, a tribute to us. I mean, we were always preached, uh, you know, you don't round your friends, you don't round on your enemies, and if you have a problem, you take it to the street. And that was the code I was brought up when I was a kid, and he preached it all along to us. And, uh, you know, don't forget that some of these people that were uh, killed by us uh, were informants. And I look back at it and I say to myself, what right do we have to kill these people for being informants when uh, Steve Fleming and Jim Bulger were the biggest informants? Basically, the, you know, 25 years of my life was a lie. You know, it wasn't this uh, gang. It was the gang of two. And it was Jim Bulger and Steve Fleming. The rest of us were... Uh, Basically, basically expendable.